It is. The title, Narcotics and International Crime as National Security Threats. Uh, and of course, uh, nearly all Americans are pained uh, by the cost to this society of the drug culture and those who support it. And to define it as a part of the national security, the United States, I think, is accurate, and I think the administration is absolutely correct in, in, in pointing out the fundamental uh, nature of, of that difficulty. And of course, we're very fortunate to be joined this evening uh, by the State Department's primary officer on the subject. And nobody has to be reminded of the uh, headlines of the present day, which relate to uh, uh, that particular topic. We're eager to get on with the topic, so let me very quickly present uh, Mr. Gelbard to you, Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. Uh, Mr. Gelbard is a, a graduate of Colby College. Uh, his, in his BA is in history. He's a, a Master of Public Administration with an emphasis on economics from Harvard, and he's done uh, uh, work in economics at MIT. During his State Department career, there's a time where he uh, works on economic and financial issues in particular in the uh, Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs and in the Bureau of European Affairs. And he also, uh, during the Bush administration, he's been a United States representative at the Paris Club, and he was Mr. Uh, Sen or President Bush's representative for preparing the San Antonio Summit. And he's been a member of numerous American delegations to the OECD, and has served on the U.S. delegation on the Conference of International Cooperation, the, the uh, North-South Dialogue. And he's also done a stint of service uh, at the President's Council of Economic Advisors. So he's a very strong um, economics training and economic emphasis within the State Department. But paralleling that have been a wide variety of not only experiences but responsible positions in various of the geographic bureaus. He served early in his career in uh, uh, the Philippines, the Republic of the Philippines, in uh, Brazil, and in France. And he has served within the department as uh, Deputy uh, Director for Western European Affairs, Director of South Southern Africa Affairs, <coughs> Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South America, and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American <coughs> Affairs. Additionally, just in conversation, of course, he was uh, uh, the Bush administration's uh, primary uh, uh, principal, rather, on, uh, on Haiti, and retains an ongoing interest uh, in that area, and it's part of his peacekeeping responsibilities, which he holds in conjunction, to his, uh, in conjunction with his current uh, position. But he's here tonight as the State Department's senior officer uh, with respect to the narcotics problem uh, it's my great pleasure then to introduce to you Ambassador Robert Gelbar. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, um, particularly now that we've taken the certification decisions. It's always useful to be able to get out of Washington, especially if nobody knows where I am. I was um, very pleased to hear that you're having the Venezuelan ambassador here next, since he's coming in to see me tomorrow. So um, I'll be happy to tell him about the warm reception he'll receive and um, give him a copy of my speech so he can begin to refute it. <laughs> um, what I thought I'd talk a bit about tonight is um, something that you don't normally hear about, I'm sure. Um, in these meetings because I'm sure what you hear about are very traditional foreign policy issues. And I started out as a very traditional foreign policy person, as you can tell. But the critical point, I think, uh, that I want to get across this evening is that, particularly in this post-Cold War environment, we uh, need to and are in the process of redefining what we consider to be national security threats primary foreign policy concerns and priorities, 
and have to begin to deal with these issues in very non-traditional ways. At the beginning of the Bush, or excuse me, at the beginning of the Clinton administration, we began to look at these issues in very different ways than we ever did before. Foreign policy is a very slow process, and if you've ever been in the State Department, you'd begin to get an idea of how slow. Um, but what is clear is that diplomacy has now entered a new era. Over the last 20 years, we've had in the State Department someone who has had my job, but that job was defined as international narcotics matters. When um, Secretary Christopher first asked to see me to talk about my taking this job, we discussed the basic question of redefining these issues in very different ways. And out of this came um, a very new type of position for which I'm responsible, but that too began to evolve in very different ways into a very different way of looking at these issues in foreign policy terms and, as I said earlier, in national security terms. Um, a very important moment, which has largely escaped attention within the United States, but has gotten enormous attention abroad, was the speech by President Clinton to the 50th anniversary of the United Nations at the General Assembly in October of 1995. Um, in that speech, President Clinton had every opportunity to focus on very traditional issues. And in fact, all my colleagues, a couple of days before when I was asked by the Deputy Secretary, Secretary Strobe Talbot to brief them on what the President was going to say, were clearly expecting the normal geographic tour d'horizon, the Middle East peace process, NATO expansion, all those admittedly very important issues. But instead, I explained that what the President was going to speak about, and he did, in fact, so I was saved, um, were things such as drug trafficking, transnational crime, terrorism, traffic and weapons of mass destruction, and money laundering. Not exactly what have been traditionally considered to be high foreign policy. But why are we looking at these issues? I mean, I can remember when I first came into the State Department, there was a big debate going on in that very learned journal, Foreign Affairs, about whether economics was to be considered high policy. And nobody talks about that anymore. Everybody assumes that economics and international commerce are fundamental priorities of our foreign policy because of the highly interdependent nature of the world today. Back as recently as 25 years ago, there was even a big debate about whether we were going to have an interdependent economy. Nobody talks about that, obviously, anymore. But now the debate is a very different one. And what we're talking about now are these new kinds of issues which are either very new issues or older problems which have now become more acute because of the very changing nature of the world. What we have to do is recognize that these are fundamental foreign policy issues. They're not just law enforcement issues because within the State Department and within the foreign policy establishment, people still consider law enforcement to be sort of a semi-derogatory term. For their part, I think the law enforcement people can't look at the foreign policy people in that parallel mirror image derogatory way. We've got to understand that we've got to deal with these issues in very different ways because they now present enormous new threats to the world as we know it, and perhaps more importantly, to the world as we would like to see it. If there is one issue we probably agree on in the United States, it's a fundamental issue of ideology, and that is our support for democracy. But what we are seeing is that the threat as it has become posed around much of the world is no longer a threat that is really traditionally, as traditionally defined in terms of a threat from the far left or a threat from the far right, but instead it's something that I would certainly argue is far more insidious and probably far more powerful. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, Frank didn't mention in my biography is that I also spent a good deal of time uh, involved in and indeed surviving uh, the Central American Civil Wars. And of course, as everyone knows, much of the reason we were involved in Central America, whether it was Nicaragua or El Salvador or elsewhere, or Angola for that matter, and I was quite involved in Angola, was because of surrogate wars coming out of, as extensions of the Cold War. Threats from the left, threats from the right. But what we're seeing 
whether it's in a place such as Colombia, or whether it's in new rogue states, which are essentially state protectors of criminal activity, such as Nigeria or Burma, is that essentially the criminal elements are the ones who are trying to impede the establishment and consolidation of, demo of democracy and the establishment and consolidation of democratic institutions. How do we deal with this? Well, first we have to recognize the problem. We have begun to try to do so within our own government. As I said, one manifestation of this, and it may seem small, but in, at least in bureaucratic terms, and that translates into budget terms, which ends up being important, was in the establishment four years ago of a very different kind of organization that I run, which now includes representatives of all the law enforcement <laughs> agencies and intelligent or intelligence organizations. What was subsequently very interesting was that the British Home Secretary, Michael Howard, came to visit me a few times, and I went to visit him. And as a result of the discussions we had, he recommended to the British uh, Foreign Secretary that they set up a parallel kind of office and organization in their government, too. And we are increasingly seeing other governments doing the same in very non-traditional ways to try to deal with the problem of counterterror or terrorism through counterterrorism measures and cooperative measures, counter-narcotics, and now increasingly in terms of law enforcement. We're trying similarly to develop new cooperative measures through the Group of Seven, through our summit cooperation, something we now have expanded more or less to call the P8 because it now includes Russia. Uh, we are trying to develop very new, different kinds of international organizations and mechanisms to deal with these problems. But the threat is obviously very large. Um, Marshall McLuhan years ago talked about the medium being the message. And the medium in this case has become a dramatically shrunken world. The same world that we recognized when we talked about a global interdependent economy. And just as stocks can be traded and currency can be traded on a 24-hour basis around the world now. So criminal organizations and terrorist organizations and drug trafficking organizations can operate in the same way, at the same speed, in very different ways than they ever were able to before and in very much faster ways than governments are now able to cope. First, we see that there are single organizations which have global reach. One of the least publicized mechanisms and problems that exists worldwide, which has direct relevance to Baltimore, is the problem of Nigerian drug trafficking and criminal organizations. These are organizations with global scope. Nigerian tra drug traffickers and their couriers, which now number in the many hundreds of thousands, operate worldwide and we calculate that last year they accounted for about 40% of the heroin that was seized coming into the United States. Well, if it's 40% of the heroin that was seized coming into the United States, we don't have a clue as to how much actually got in, but we can probably guess that it was something pretty similar because they're very smart people. These are people who have set up organizations in South Africa. There are 80,000 Nigerians in South Africa, most of whom are engaged, according to the South African government, in criminal activity. They have set up major bases out of Bangkok. They have set up major bases out of Chicago, and yes, out of Baltimore. One of my colleagues who just left um, my organization, where he was working as a senior advisor to me for four years, had been an assistant U.S. attorney here in Baltimore and he was the one responsible for making the Nigerian cases. And there are numerous cases made by the U.S. Attorney's Office here involving Nigerian drug trafficking crime, Nigerian white collar crime, which is calculated to cost the American taxpayer about $25 billion a year. $25 billion a year, mostly involving telephone scams, credit card scams, and if you've ever seen these phony Nigerian fundraising letters, anybody ever seen this? Exactly. Don't answer them. I know of a man in Texas who not only put up $50,000 to start, somewhere I heard something about not throwing good money after bad. He's apparently now spent a million dollars 
because he's sure that he's going to get that money promised to him from people who say they're with the Nigerian National Oil Company or their central bank. Um, and, of course, Nigeria has become one of the major money laundering centers in the world. Um, a few years ago, when I was in Thailand, we knew Thailand was one of their major centers because that's where they buy the opium and the heroin, particularly from the Burmese drug trafficking organizations. The Thai foreign minister was complaining to me, this was in early 1994, that he had 300 to 350 Nigerian drug traffickers in jail, and what was he going to do with them? And I was very impressed by that story, and I, I told everybody I came in contact with, with foreign governments about this for a couple of years, until I went back to Thailand a year and a half ago. And I saw the foreign minister again, and I said to him that I, I had been so impressed by his story that I'd been going around telling everybody about those 300 to 350 Nigerian drug traffickers in jail. And he said, 300? So we're up to 750, and it's growing all the time. So I think now it's up to about 1,000. And at the same time, right after that meeting, I traveled over to Cambodia, and we learned of a deal that had just been broken by DEA. In fact, there was an agent who had been based here until he was transferred to Bangkok, um, working with the Thai police, which involved a, an attempt that was stopped of, by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia to sell SAM-7 ground air missiles to the Burmese drug traffickers in exchange for three and a half kilos of heroin and the middleman was a Nigerian. And that sort of captured it all for me. Meanwhile, in South Africa, we have seen a dramatic takeover of crime, an establishment of crime by these Nigerian groups. And in many ways, this represents almost a perfect, tragic paradigm of the problem we see. This, as in some other cases, is the case of a struggling new democracy attempting to consolidate itself, trying to emerge, of course, from decades of apartheid. Sanctions were ended. Transportation links were renewed. Financial sector is growing again. But all the criminal elements are using all those mechanisms with which to enrich themselves. This was the largest unregulated financial sector I knew of in the world. South African government came to us and we have now provided assistance to them on a new world-class anti-money laundering law. We're also trying to provide other assistance that I'll refer to a little later. But what we are seeing overall are the establishment of these criminal organizations which are extending their roots worldwide. In other cases, we see criminal organizations which develop alliances. Uh, it is not uncommon now to see linkages develop between, for example, the Kali cartel, the Italian mafia, and Russian organized crime. Last week, the Polish Minister of Interior, and as I think most of you know, Ministers of Interior in other countries don't care about trees, they care about criminals, um, as I remind Bruce Babbitt all the time. Um, he was coming to me to complain, among other things, that they have become a crossroads of transnational crime. And we knew that they had recently broken up a drug trafficking organization, and you can basically connect the dots around the map involving Polish, Hungarian, Brazilian, Nigerian, Colombian drug traffickers, taking advantage of new open airways, ports, and still a lack of strong institutions. And we readily see these organizations making contact with each other in new and very sophisticated ways. There are now 40 Russian banks on the island of Antigua. I don't know why. Yes, I, yes, I do. Um, what's the effect of this? I think the most dramatic and tragic case is Colombia, as I said earlier. Colombia is perhaps one of the oldest, most established democratic systems in this hemisphere. But what we have seen over the last quarter of a century is the systematic conscious erosion of democratic, social, political institutions, even the church, by drug trafficking organizations. And what they have been able to do with their extraordinary amount of funds is by institutions. So we now have the incredible situation in Colombia of a president 
who is clearly corrupt, and I'm not just saying it here, I've said it in the press, and I've said it on television. He doesn't like me. Um, we have a Congress in Colombia which has probably had a third to two-thirds of its members corrupted by the traffickers. And I don't know how many of the judges, prosecutors, and others similarly have been corrupted. And they're able to play a very nice three-corner effect. When President Samper was finally put up for um, impeachment before his Congress because he had knowingly solicited and accepted something in the range of $6.6 .6 million from the traffickers, uh, very conveniently, just before the Congress had an opportunity to vote, the Constitutional Court decided that campaign spending limits were illegal. So there went the biggest charges. Um, but in this case, Samper is a man um, whom we knew was corrupted. He had, has a history going back to at least 1982 of soliciting and receiving drug funds. And early in his campaign, about six months before the election, he came to Washington. And it was agreed that I would meet with him privately. Um, and I sat him down and um, I explained to him that we have a great intelligence base of knowledge in Colombia and that we were aware that he was systematically soliciting and receiving millions of dollars of drug funds from drug traffickers. And of course, he denied it. And I said it again in case he'd missed my Spanish. But he denied it again, and we went through this. And he said, well, you know, maybe it's small contributions. It's not small contributions. It's millions. So he kept denying it. And finally, I said, look, the election's six months off. If you continue to do this, and you're elected president, we will have a bad relationship. So it must stop now. And of course, he went back, and we immediately began to get a large flow of information about what he was doing, including to the point after the first round of the election where one of his American advisors, a very prominent, who, who's innocent in all this, a very prominent pollster came to see me an old friend of mine, and he said, look, we know, I know you believe that Samper is, is corrupt, but the proof that he is innocent is that here, the second round of the election is coming, he has no money left. And he needs about three to three and a half million dollars. Well, a little while later, after the election, when the tapes came out involving Miguel Rodriguez Orjuela, the leading drug trafficker in Bolivia, talking to his bag man, and the substance of the conversation was, just delivered the 3.2 million dollars. Um, and that, of course, has set the tone in terms of the environment that the Colombian government, at least the corrupt parts of the Colombian government, have tried to create to continue to allow an extraordinary flow of cocaine, 80 percent of the cocaine that's produced in the world, and a rapidly increasing amount of heroin to the point that all the heroin that is found now in the northeastern United States is from Colombia. They've pushed out the Southeast Asian producers. And similarly, we have, as I mentioned earlier, other state protectors of criminality, sort of a parallel to what we call uh, state sponsors of terrorism. Governments, regimes, I shouldn't honor them by calling them governments, such as the military dictatorship in Nigeria, which protects these drug trafficking and other criminal groups, which are based in Lagos. And of course, the um, extraordinarily named State Law Enforcement Restoration Council, or SLORC, of Burma, um, who assumed power in 1988. Um, and since then, opium poppy production and heroin production have soared to the point that Burma is now far and away the largest producer of opium poppies and heroin in the world, far and away and produce about 60% of the heroin that comes into the United States. Recently, just to add um, to their shamelessness, they um, decided to not only pardon a man named Kun Sa, who is sort of the Pablo Escobar of the heroin world, but they even are now treating him with the honorific letter U, U at the beginning of his name, which shows that he is a, um, a, an honored individual. There continues to be, unfortunately, a significant flow of foreign investment into Burma, mostly from their Asian neighbors. Fifteen percent of the total amount of foreign investment that has gone into Burma 
since the slork has taken over comes from a drug trafficker named Lo Shing Han, and now handled by his son, a man named Stephen Lo, who are also investing significant amounts in Singapore. It is a source, obviously, of enormous concern to us that we've been unable to get the slork to try to change either in the areas of human rights and democracy or in the areas of law enforcement. But of course, it's not coincidental that in places such as Nigeria, we have massive human rights violators in the government, as well as sponsors of criminality. In Colombia, we have a democratically elected government with one of the worst human rights records in the world, as you'll see all the time. Also one of the state protectors of criminality, but similarly, of course, in Burma. We have also now seen a dramatic growth, as I was alluding to earlier, in terms of other kinds of criminality around the world that affect the national security of some of the countries that are either our closest friends or countries that we care deeply about, particularly newly democratic nations of Central Europe and Eastern Europe. We are trying to work in much closer ways than ever uh, with Russia, with other nations of the newly independent states, and as I mentioned in the case of Poland, with them, with Hungary, Czech Republic, the Baltics, and lots of others. And it's very similar to what I was describing as we try to do in Latin America. The fundamental issue is the development of strong democratic institutions. At the core of any democracy, I have come to believe, is the justice sector. People must have faith in the justice sector. Presidents come and go, legislatures come and go, but usually the justice sector and all its various components stay, and people must have faith. They must have a feeling that they can have recourse. They must feel that whether they have a complaint against their neighbor or against the government, that'll be heard and be heard fa fairly. So we have increasingly tried to put enormous <coughs> emphasis in terms of institution building as a way of combating these problems. Long-term solution, but obviously this is imperative. If we believe in the principles of democracy and if we want to have strong institutional measures to deal with these problems in those countries. So in a number of nations around the world, either bilaterally working with those countries or on a multilateral basis, we have begun significant programs to try to develop democratic police, whether it's Russia, South Africa, countries in Latin America, Central Europe. This has been a fundamental effort on our part. We are putting significant efforts into the training of prosecutors, judicial reform, major program that we have in Colombia, not surprisingly, uh, training of judges, uh, court reporters, and all the various other aspects you can think of. And of course, to wrap that all up, are the, are the need is the need to develop strong laws. So for example, we have had and been developing um, programs of advisors, whether it's people from the Justice Department and their system, including assistant US attorneys, working in Russia to help provide advice, this is really true, to the Duma, their parliament, to the government itself, on writing a new criminal code. We did that, and a new criminal procedures code. Or in places like South Africa, where the Minister of Justice has asked for, and I'm providing an advisor for a year to help them rewrite all their criminal laws and review all their criminal procedures and write other new laws as needed. But the establishment of laws, and of course their implementation, is really critical if this is going to be bound together in a very serious way. We have been also, as I mentioned earlier, trying to develop much stronger alliances with other industrialized countries, particularly, as I said, the G7, uh, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Italy, Canada, Japan, and now Russia, uh, to take strong concerted action, uh, whether it's against money laundering, uh, whether it's on training police or other kinds of issues, developing international standards. And uh, now that we're going to be the host at the next G7 summit in Denver this year, we have the leadership in trying to develop programs of this kind that have been moving along very well. When the president gave his speech in October of 95, when we recognized that 
we were dealing with new threats or more acute threats or, or threats which have really, as my daughter would say, morphed in the way that they now appear. We also recognized, and more importantly, he also recognized that we need new tools to deal with these problems. As I said, they're smart, they're very rich, they hire the best security services, they hire the best computer experts, they can now buy encrypted secure communications, as we find. So we have to try to deal with this in new ways. Um, we have begun to use new legal instruments in ways that do cause some concern, I think needless concern, on the part of some, whether on the far right or the far left. The president has begun to try to, to seek authority to use wiretap, uh, court-ordered wiretaps, of course, in new and different ways than ever before, particularly for terrorism threats. The president has now invoked a very powerful legal instrument for law enforcement purposes, something called the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. This is, this is a law you've probably never heard of. Uh, this is a law that we normally use to freeze the assets of countries uh, or individuals in countries with which we're at war. Iraq, Iran, just like that. In the course of his speech in October of 95 at the UN, the President announced that he was using this to freeze the assets of the Kali cartel. And what we have done is to, working through the Treasury Department, freeze all their accounts of individuals and their front companies and their legitimate companies, including the largest drugstore chain. I know it's called drugstore, I couldn't help it. Um, in Colombia, that was owned by the Kali cartel. We have now frozen the assets of some 400 individuals and companies. And of course, in the process of doing so, have also forbidden American companies from doing business with them. The net result is, uh, is heartening. And um, a few months ago, I saw an extraordinary article in Newsweek about the children of the leaders of the Kali cartel. The leaders are now jailed, um, complaining that they're poor since all their assets had been frozen. And that's a good sign. Um, we have begun to press money laundering as a much higher priority. In the course of this administration, the President has signed three major directives about crime. One was a Western Hemisphere drug strategy, one was a global heroin strategy, and one was an international crime strategy. Um, as a result of this, we are trying to work first multilaterally through an organization that we and other industrialized countries set up called the Financial Action Task Force, which has just invoked sanctions against the government of Turkey for refusing to uh, pass any laws and implement them about money laundering. And we have begun to identify uh, some of the countries we consider to be the most egregious offenders in refusing to uh, pass laws and implement them about money laundering, thereby becoming major havens for the money. And that's the answer to the question of why there are 40 Russian banks in Antigua. They have carefully designed themselves, and they're even on the internet, as a haven for dirty money. And so we have gone out of our way now to identify um, a, a number of countries and to offer to work with them, to provide them technical assistance, to help them come up to international standards. We don't discriminate. This is a global list. It even includes some countries that might surprise you. But we are trying to work with them and help them if they want help. But the President also said in his speech that if they don't want help, and if they continue to be egregious offenders, he is prepared to invoke other laws whereby they would be unable to use what's, what's a fairly esoteric mechanism, but let me just say that it basically would prohibit them from using dollars. They would be unable to use the dollar clearinghouse systems around the world, which is a pretty powerful threat. And we're in the process now of engaging some of these countries and while we don't want to threat, threaten, good diplomats don't threaten, I'm always told, uh, we are trying to find ways for them to be educated as to the nature of these problems. Meanwhile, we're also concerned about a number of other problems, which may sound trivial, sometimes people laugh, but are very important to the American citizens. And we care about American citizens. 
Some people sometimes say the State Department doesn't, but we do. Stolen cars. Um, we have, uh, when I first got into this job, I was approached by the organization of American insurance companies. And we found out why all our insurance rates are going up. It's because about a third of the stolen cars in the United States go overseas. And they're put in containers, they're driven across borders, um, they, they leave here. Um, it is, a couple of years ago I was in Seattle when the FBI broke up a stolen car ring in Washington State and Oregon and they were shipping all the cars to Siberia uh, because there's a hot market there for these cars, no pun intended. Um, we have just initialed a stolen car treaty last week with the government of Poland because American cars are showing up there. We're negotiating treaties with the governments of Central America and offering them technical assistance because there are cars that are going through Mexico, down through Central America, and get very high prices. Uh, four years ago, we did a little survey through our embassy in Belize, and we discovered that 50% of the cars in Belize had been stolen from the United States. Um, as Frank said, I do a lot of work in um, some other strange countries on peacekeeping operations, and I saw a Ferrari with Texas plates in a place called Eastern Slavonia in the eastern part of Croatia. And uh, I guarantee you it was stolen, we checked. Um, but we are trying to look at problems, large and small, which affect the American uh, taxpayer and citizens because of the increasing transnational nature of this problem. I want to be very clear about the issue of drugs. We can't solve the problem of drugs through supply reduction programs alone. This has to be a very balanced approach. You will notice that when the President announced his new narcotics strategy last week, he announced a significant increase in programs related to rehabilitation, treatment, education, information. We have to do more of that. We have to get our Congress to appropriate the funds for those programs. There has to be a strong combination of increased emphasis on demand reduction as well as increased emphasis on supply reduction. But supply reduction remains very important for two reasons. One, because, and I get into these arguments all the time in Latin America in particular, chicken and egg arguments. What's more important, supply or demand? Well, my argument is that in the case of drugs, it's not like a normal traded good. Supply is important. Supply is important because it affects us, it affects our children, but it also affects them to the degree they don't recognize the nature of the threat. And I will tell you that as demand for cocaine has dropped precipitously in the United States, it's gone up precipitously in Europe. But to the degree they don't recognize this, there are more and more of them who are going to end up like Colombia. We're seeing it in Mexico, where traditional conduits and channels for corruption have now been taken over from what was, in quotes, acceptable corruption to now what's unacceptable corruption. And we have, as the president of Mexico, an honest, serious man in Ernesto Cedillo, who when he got into office, before, the week before he got into office, when he sat down with Bill Clinton at lunch in the White House, said, I don't know what to do. This is the biggest problem I have to face. But he quickly identified it as the number one national security problem that he had but he's particularly worried because when he presses the buttons and pulls the levers, nothing happens. He has no institutional capabilities. We obviously have enormous concerns about this for, for more, than, more than the reasons we would have with Colombia. Mexico is our closest neighbor along with Canada. Um, we have uh, in Mexico one of our closest trading partners and we have what at best can be a difficult relationship with Mexico. The national security of Mexico is our national security concern too. So we have to be and are continuing to be intensely engaged with them in trying to help them right this ship, build strong institutions and develop the right kinds of mechanisms that they need. Meanwhile, we need to continue to be engaged um, not just with Mexico but around the world and really continue to see how these threats affect us.
What has been encouraging, and I, I, I want to be, I, I think I should correct something I started off an impression I, I may have given in the beginning. Um, President Clinton certainly recognized these issues as national security issues and has approached these in very different ways. But I think in many ways this is a trend which had begun to start certainly during the Bush administration and probably uh, certainly during the Reagan administration. But we're seeing it, I think, in a very qualitatively different way than ever before. Um, when the Secretary of State last week stood with me to announce the results of drug certification, it was the first time a Secretary of State had ever done that. She was clearly recognizing, as she did by being present to announce the results of our human rights reports, the fundamental importance of these issues. And I think you will increasingly see within this U.S. government, within successor governments, but also with, it, with other governments, that these issues will continue to rise to the forefront of the agenda, non-traditional as they may be. Thank you. Well, we thank you very much for uh, a surprisingly uh, uh, detailed uh, presentation filled with, I think, most interesting information. Our <coughs> procedure here is that I have to repeat the questions for the television camera. Uh, if that isn't too big a, an imposition. So with your indulgence, we'll uh, follow that uh, procedure. The, the question is whether uh, the World Federalist <coughs> suggestion of an international criminal court at the UN uh, would be helpful in your enterprise. We uh, have been very interested, very involved in the, all the issues related to the idea of establishing an international criminal court. We have, however, serious reservations about using it for terrorist issues or drug trafficking issues. Our concern really relates to um, the question of international standards. Our principal goal around the world, whether it's in dealing with a country like Colombia or Mexico or other nations in other parts of the world, has been not to look for lowest common denominator solutions, but to try to raise standards. So we have been, for example, encouraging countries to um, uh, develop and approve extradition laws, to improve sentencing laws and sentencing procedures, and, and other kinds of mechanisms. I mentioned money laundering, where we have um, a range of, of standards. And I have to say, in all frankness, that my experience has been <clears throat> that when we develop multinational entities of this sort, there tends to be a dilution. As I say, lowest common denominator. And we tend to end up with solutions which are quite frustrating to us, instead of trying to go for maximalist solutions. We do support the use of the International Criminal Court for other kinds of, of, of issues. But as you may be aware, for example, we have resisted all offers by Gaddafi for example, to use some kind of ad hoc international criminal court to try the people indicted in the United States for the bombing of Pan Am 103. Uh, we feel there have to be the right kinds of standards to be met, and, and we do have serious concerns about that. How would you compare the corruption of American institutions by drug traffickers with what you've seen overseas? There's no question that drug money corrupts everywhere. Um, we have certainly seen it in the law enforcement community in the United States. We've even occasionally seen a few higher level people, but that's the fundamental difference. The, there has been and continues to be an ability on the part of drug trafficking organizations and other kinds of criminal organizations to corrupt at very high levels. President of Colombia, the former president of Bolivia, country to which I was ambassador, um, other senior officials of other countries. The, um, and their ability to go after these senior officials, I think, is without parallel. And it's not something we have seen here. We do see and have constant concerns about potential or actual corruption of law enforcement agents at a variety of levels, um, customs officials, border patrol, um, Immigration Service, and some DEA. There was the um, admittedly embarrassing event that the DEA official who arrested uh, Noriega 
was subsequently arrested for drug trafficking. Um, and I know my colleagues in the Justice Department made sure that he was prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law as an example. What we try to do is have a regular process of polygraphing. And uh, that's something that we try to encourage other governments to do. For example, Mexico. That's one of the things we're pressing them to do right now. But there is a standard and continuous process within our government, as I understand it, among the law enforcement community to do, to do exactly that. We try to encourage, in terms of, of institutional development, the development of internal affairs units, for example. And, and that's a constant struggle, too. This is not something they're used to. Would, would you describe the uh, cooperation among the various American government agencies uh, in this field? On sort of a random basis, we talk to each other, you know. Um, we actually cooperate and, and talk a lot better and a lot more than most people think. In the case of uh, the Partnership for Peace, this is a program to reach out to many countries which um, are non-NATO members, some of which may be included if and when there is NATO expansion, but others of which um, are in this program where we try <clears throat> in a variety of ways, military and others, to develop greater cooperation, greater sophistication, uh, greater institutional development. Um, we do work very closely with the Defense Department, but also through, uh, in this case, it would be bureaucratically, the Bureau of European Affairs. But once again, this is a perfect example of what I have been talking about in terms of the need for institutional development. We are trying to engage with many of these countries in a fundamental reorientation of many of their institutions. What should the role of the military be in the Czech Republic? What is the role of the police? How does one police? How does one handle law enforcement in Poland? And instead of the very top-down repressive nature, we have been trying to reorient them into de democratic community-based policing. And in that regard, and I'm really glad you asked that question because I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, the director of the FBI and I um, made a trip to Central and Eastern Europe in the summer of 1994. And we visited about five or six countries, finally ending up in uh, Russia and Ukraine. And we, um, we decided to set up uh, what, what is now called the International Law Enforcement Academy, and it's based in Budapest. The idea is to train police, multilateral police, so they get to know each other. And this is a multilateral program. We bring in instructors from other countries, Italy, Ireland, England, a number of other European countries. Um, France has held out. Yeah. Uh, but lots of others. And we try to train them in a combination of basic policing techniques and more sophisticated techniques and get them to get to know each other. But we're also embarked on bilateral programs with all these countries. We have a very large uh, assistance program that has been geared towards Central Europe and Eastern Europe. And uh, we are working, um, I have the budget and then I work with the law enforcement community to develop a strategy in each country and regionally and sub-regionally and then we have been trying to develop training programs ranging from the most basic policing issues that we among the Western democracies know about from childhood but is really something that's quite rare for police who grow up in or for people who grow up in dictatorships to much more sophisticated techniques. We don't teach them surveillance, they're good at that but we do teach them basic things in forensics and other kinds of techniques. And this basic orientation of these institutions and trying to reorient them to a fundamentally more democratic approach, a more sophisticated approach, is really what we are trying to do. Interestingly, I should add, we are having, just as our Defense Department colleagues are having more, um, more success, or more, more rapid success in certain countries, so are we in countries such as Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, because they were probably never more, they, they were never as embedded in the communist system, really, and more nationalistic than some of the others. To what extent do you think we, 
uh, carry some of the responsibility for the uh, uh, drug trafficking to our country? First of all, I completely disagree with this disinformation that has come up about the CIA in Central America. Uh, there is absolutely no proof, and this is, as far as I can tell, a lot of lies. John Deutsch, I think, was, uh, did a very courageous thing that I certainly wouldn't have done by going to speak in uh, high school in South Central Los Angeles to talk about this. I have tried, uh, as I said, I was involved in some issues related to Central America, particularly the El Salvador peace process. Um, I have no reason to believe, I've never seen any intelligence, I've never seen anything that causes me to believe that there was involvement of the CIA in any of this. It's certainly conceivable that people who were, who were among the Contras or maybe among some other groups could have also been drug traffickers. But there has been nothing in any of the witnesses, the so-called witnesses who have been called, either in the United States or elsewhere, that has shown one shred of veracity to this. Not too long ago, I had lunch with the producer of, um, with a producer of one of the um, best-known television shows involved in so-called exposés, very reputable, highly reputable. He had looked into this himself, the San Jose Mercury articles, and he said it was a bunch of crap. Um, and I believe that. Now, um, the avenues for corruption are there. I have never really studied what happened with some of the Southeast Asian insurgent groups back during the Vietnam War and Air America. There are books that have come out which are considered to be relatively respectable, which allege the use of Air America, the use of some other means for, uh, for drugs. I don't know. But um, I certainly do, don't believe this story. We try to develop as many mechanisms as we can, as I said earlier. U.S. government officials are polygraphed on a regular basis. That's certainly the case for the CIA. They are regularly polygraphed. Um, in addition, there are all kinds of other tests, and occasionally we have other kinds of problems, like Aldrich Ames and some of these other traders. Um, but that's why, as I say, we have internal affairs agencies. We have inspector general's offices. We have, I mean, I, I am under more inspections, not accused of drug trafficking, but because I have a large budget, we, we have inspections on a continuing basis from our own inspector general, from the government accounting office, from others, all the time. And yes, we have to be accountable. <coughs> companies, commercial companies. Well, first of all, um, if anybody ever had any knowledge, I would, I would love to know about it. We are great believers in supporting our Justice Department in prosecutions, including of lawyers. And as you may not know, I don't dislike lawyers, don't no. apply. Um, but recently, we feel that a number of lawyers, American lawyers who, who had been reputable years ago, who represented senior Kali cartel leaders, crossed the line, and they're currently under indictment. Which, ha which has caused a certain amount of nervousness, I think, um, uh, in the ABA. So make some questions about the ethics of all this. One of them in particular had been a pretty senior Justice Department lawyer at one point. But to the degree that we know, we investigate American companies all the time. The Justice Department investigates American companies. Money laundering is a particularly active enterprise. And there is a continuing series of investigations, indictments, cases that go on in the United States about this, including among some of the most prominent banks in the United States. But then what's come of that problem? Why do we have it? What kind of problem do you mean? Consumption? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, this is a transnational problem. And increasingly what we have found is that because of the transnational nature of it, We've increasingly seen that drug traffic in the, in the United States is largely run. And I'm not trying to point fingers at, at groups overseas, but it's a fact. It's largely run 
by foreign groups in the United States. Yes, there are small-time dealers, or sometimes even big dealers, who are American. But fundamental distribution of cocaine in the United States on the East Coast is done by the Colombians. That is a fact. Increasingly, it is being done by Dominicans. That is a fact. There are Americans who are involved. At the street level, um, in Washington, D.C., we, we, we had this uh, fellow who is now um, talking, he's in jail, named Rayful Edmond, who was a big dealer in the 80s. Um, but, and on the West Coast, what DEA tells me is that the distribution all the way up to, to British Columbia is done by Mexican groups. That is a fact. We can diagram it, we can prove it, we can show it. Yes, they have American citizen allies, but because of the increasing transnational nature of crime, because of these alliances I talked about earlier, they reach agreements on things. That's one of the wonderful things about being able to do undercover operations. People can go in and say they're American citizens and make deals. But the fact of the matter is that in New York City right now, drug trafficking is run by Colombians. Um, when I walk around the Lower East Side of Manhattan, you see Colombian drug traffickers on corners selling dope. That's a fact. It is a fact that um, my colleague, who was an assistant U.S. attorney here, indicted one of the leader, leaders of the Cali cartel in Baltimore for murdering a citizen of Baltimore here. And the Cali cartel leader was named Santa Cruz Londonio. He was subsequently murdered in Colombia. He also was indicted for murdering a newspaper editor in Queens, in New York. But that shows the reach. And we usually can tell when the Colombians do it because they kill not just the person they're going after, but the whole family and the parakeet. Uh, they're very bloodthirsty people. I was just talking to a journalist I know yesterday who's doing a series of articles right now about international crime in New York. Uh, I just read a book about Chinese gangs in New York. And I mean, much of this has been a combination of people who bring in aliens, smuggle in aliens. And I, I have responsibility for that problem too, alien smuggling. But these are people who are traffickers. They traffic in people, they traffic in drugs, they tra traffic in endangered species, you know, rhino horn. And when we get some of their ledgers, you see entries for all these different kinds. And, and you see that all over New York. And I was talking to a sociologist, a Taiwanese American who teaches at Rutgers, who writes extensively about this. I mean, this is a fact. These are international operations going on now. And, and it's created by what I was talking about in reference to South Africa. The changing nature of, of telecommunications, transportation, computers, all these things have made the world a very different place than they used to be before. Ambassador Gelbard, um, given the topic, it's, it's hard to say it's been an enjoyable evening, <laughs> but uh, certainly it's been of great benefit to us. And we're certainly grateful for your education of us this evening and grateful also for the the years of such spectacular public service which you've given to the nation. Thank you very much. Thank you.